Welcome. I'm Daniel Four, and this talk is called Being the Face of Our Ancestors. And I'm glad for you to be here with us. The question that I would invite uh, up front for our hour of time is <clears throat> How do the ancestors already move and speak through you in your everyday life? Because they do. And we'll talk about that. And before we get into that, I want to say a few just practical things. For one, uh, can folks hear me well enough? Is the sound okay? Yeah, great. Okay. Somebody said they couldn't hear in the chat, but it seems like it's okay. Um, <clears throat> and briefly, the main thing I want to say is that we have a course open right now through Ancestral Medicine called Beyond Blood Ancestors. It's open to anybody. And if you've done any amount of the lineage healing process that I share and that we you know, work with with the organization, uh, this work is directly specifically complementary to that. So it's working with other kinds of ancestors that are not only blood lineage ancestors, which I tend to focus on quite a bit. So the description you know, is in the chat and all that. I won't belabor it, but it's a nice offering. It'll be just for six weeks and we'll explore content that it's things I like to teach to, but I usually hold back on because I, I don't want people to skip steps or like not work with their blood lineages. But I'm like, okay, it's been six years of doing this other thing. Let me teach a little bit to that fun stuff. So that's happening. <clears throat> Otherwise, we have a lot of self-paced courses, a lot of things going on. Great to check that out if you're moved. So <clears throat> let me say something about who I am. Some of you have heard me talk and talk, but briefly, I am personally embody the descendant of uh, early English and German, mostly settler colonialists in North America by way of Pennsylvania and Ohio. I grew up in Ohio and uh, I lived in the United States for the first um, 44 years and 11 months of my life and moved about six weeks ago to Spain. And I live in um, now in La Suya and Granada province, Andalusia and with my wife and our two girls and uh, that's great i'm really happy to be here and i'm a doctor of psychology so i have a psych background i'm trained as a licensed therapist once upon a time and mostly i'm a ritualist so i'm the founder director guy at ancestral medicine and uh, i love it it's really nice actually despite various demands that go with it and i have specialized over the last 20 years or so in work with the dead, work with the ancestors. And we'll talk about that some tonight, but I also love the earth and the many beings and feel really worried about where we're headed because it's kind of a mess right now. And I want us to do better as a species and care a lot and, you know, it's like a person trying to work it out really into spirituality and stuff. And so I bring that angle, yeah. Uh, so that's me a little bit. Um, so I'll talk for maybe half an hour. We'll do a little question, do some practice, do some more questions. We'll see where we end up. What do I mean by the ancestors? Because if I don't give a little bit of um, context, then it's hard to receive the other things I might want to explore a bit. In a general way, I'm not going to go way into the like how to work with them details and what about this and what about past lives it's just not our focus tonight but what do i mean by them generally the, the ancestors are the collective wisdom of our species as i use the word it's the the big spirit of human of human think of like individual bears and then the bear spirit like ancestors like the human spirit and they, they're just our human ancestors because we're in human form of course they're bear ancestors but we're not bears and uh the word can be used in a more expansive way to refer to the other than human kin that we're related to as well. That's beautiful, fantastic. I'm using it a little more narrowly. And the word can be used even more narrowly to refer to the ones who are really quite at peace as opposed to the ones who are still in a troubled condition after death, the not yet ancestors, the ghosts, the ones that are like, They've started a rite of passage, but it hasn't quite uh, landed yet. They haven't arrived at their new condition. So 
the we can think of like the ancestors as um, I put in my notes is the uh, the many faced singular human. Like, what do you mean by that, Daniel? I put that in my notes earlier today. I mean that there is a, a, a an essence, if you will, to our species. Every form has its most beautiful expression, <clears throat> and the ancestors have insight into that because their accumulated life experience in human form contributes to that uh, story uh, and that essence of what we are. And so in that way, I think of them as like the, you know, the many gendered, beautifully multiracial librarian of the species. Like they are um, uh, the collective wisdom, right? And our specific relationship with them is like our access point for that. Because we're not all the things, thank goodness, it'd be very overwhelming, but we're some specific things, whatever they are, you know, geographically, body-wise, culturally. And uh, if we can inhabit and embrace the specific forms that we are, I'm talking about human diversity now, what becomes clear is that those forms, our specific cultural location is actually a, like an on-ramp or a, an access point to this collective wisdom or this big spirit of human. And, and that's really lovely and really, uh, really cool. I recommend engaging with that, obviously. Um, our uh, relationship with the ancestors also has a lot to do with our sense of belonging and how we feel about our bodies. And if we have uh, an aversion or a negative view of our cultures of origin or our people or our group identity, we're gonna to tend to translate that to our own body and our own sense of self and move in a less kind and helpful way in the world usually. And so uh, feeling good about and relating with our ancestors contributes to a sense of um, self-love and uh, like celebration of the specific bodies we are uh, as well. And uh, contributes to a sense of belonging. But you know, I could say a lot about all that, but let me shift now to what do I mean when I talk about relating with the ancestors? Again, I'm not going into the details of how to do that in this talk. I've talked about that in other places a lot. And I, and I wanna start by saying a little about what it isn't. And, uh, and what, what it's not is just an idea or psychological only for one. You know, I'm a therapist. I can interface with therapists. I like mostly love therapists and, you know, there's a complicated bunch of people, but um, I, uh, I know that it is very tempting with you, especially, but not only if you have a psychological training or like a philosophical intellectual training to want to see the ancestors as just a, a part of you, just some aspect of what you are. And I, I feel actually really strongly, like, don't do that. Like if I, uh, if I said, uh, if I'm guiding a parenting class and I'm like, you should just see your kids as a part of you. It'll turn out great. You're like, whoa, that's bad advice. Or like if like if like it's like relationship counseling, your partner is just a part of you. They're just a part of your psyche. You just need to like manage them. They're there for to meet your needs. Whoa, that's gonna turn out like really badly. Don't do that. So we know from the other meaningful relationships that we attempt that if we see others only through the lens of us, or only as a part of us, or only there for us we just don't get great results. And I'm saying pragmatically, it doesn't matter what you believe, but pragmatically start from a kind of stance as like, well, the ancestors have their own existence. They're not only a thought, an idea or whatever. We have a part of us that is like our ancestral identity, but, but that's different. We have a picture of our spouse or our children in our own psyche as well. Hopefully that's based in the reality of who they are. Sometimes that lines up, sometimes it doesn't, but uh, nonetheless, they exist outside of us. So, so there's that. It's also 
really important that we don't think of the ancestors as just the ones we know anything about. They're not just the recent dead. If I ask, you ask almost anybody when this topic comes up, and like, I'm, I can't bring it up even anymore. People ask me, they corner me, like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I teach people to talk to the dead. <laughs> like, oh yeah, okay, how so? And the, uh, um, everybody automatically assumes it's the people that they know. It's the last few generations, maybe. And it's like, if I said like, I'm a marine biologist, and people were like, oh, you study the waves at the beach, like the little part of the wave that like crashes on the beach, right? I was like, no, no, that's part of the ocean. That's true. But I actually sometimes study the part that's like, you can't even see it from the beach, the other, the big part of the ocean, right? And so the, the most of the ancestors are not remembered by name or face or deed or historical event. And that means that when we suggest that we're going to relate with them, that we have to break a cultural taboo and go into a different mode of knowing, a different kind of relational or animist, or if you wish to call it indigenous epistemology, like a, a relational kind of knowing that we're actually very good at as humans, but it uh, is often conditioned uh, out of us or discouraged or like, oh, don't do that. You're going to be, become very irrational. And, you know, now I don't even know what's going to happen, but don't do that. So, <laughs> yeah. So there's not just the recent dead. And another thing is, um, I don't really mean when I'm suggesting, like, becoming the face of your ancestors more consciously, that we're becoming the face of the troubled ones. That's another uh, very common reaction. It's like, well, why, uh, why would I want to become the face of my ancestors when they're really awful people when, when they were on earth? Well, assuming they haven't healed things up, and they might not have, you don't really want to become the face of them. That's not recommended. I, in that way of talking about it, I would use the more narrow understanding of ancestors to refer to those who are at peace, those who are safe to relate with, those who are in a settled condition. A lot of what we're up to with the practitioner training and the ancestral medicine work and lineage healing and all that has to do with assisting the dead who are not yet at peace to become more at peace, to bring healing and like a settled, resolved energy to the larger human body in that particular corner of activity. But don't, I'm not talking about be, um, channeling the ghosts. Don't do that. I mean, maybe if you have some really skilled practice, but still mostly don't do that. I don't do that. I don't recommend it. Um, and the, the last thing I want to say about what it isn't, um, now it's a funny way to talk about a topic. It's not worship. I'm not doing ancestor worship. Um, when I go to the dentist, I'm not doing dentist worship. Uh, when I um, you know, go to even a spiritual teacher for guidance, I'm not doing spiritual teacher worship. I'm like, it's possible to invite perspective and counsel or healing or support from others, human or otherwise, without um, having that tone of relationship. And so when I encourage people to relate with the ancestors, some people that might, um, I'm not judging if folks find resonance with that. If they're like, no, I do engage in ancestor worship. I'm like, well, good for you, it's fine. But I say that because sometimes people from a religious perspective, different kinds of you know, religious doctrines or whatnot will be like, hey, um, you shouldn't worship the ancestors. It's like, okay, sounds good. I'll, I'll keep not worshiping them. I'm relating with them. Like I relate with the earth, my kids, my wife, my friends. It's a relationship. It's okay. It doesn't, like, doesn't have to be religious. There's no need to change your name. There's no need to adopt any kind of other identity. It can be a very, like, atheists usually go to the dentist. They still are not dentist worshiping. And so you can be an atheist, so to speak, and uh, relate with the ancestors because they're just part of the infrastructure of reality. Like, if you're a really devout materialist, then it might be a stretch to consider that consciousness is not only the body. 
So once you're like, we're only the body, it might be a little harder to relate with ancestral spirits, I suppose, but it's important to lay it out that it's not, I'm not talking about a religious thing per se. Yeah. So the, the main reasons <clears throat> that I do relate with them and I encourage other people to do, I'll say as briefly and then get to the heart of what I want to say, is for the intent of personal and family healing because a lot of what we struggle with is their unresolved legacy. And for the purposes of remembering our destiny and purpose, because we all have particular, uh, a particular kind of shine, particular kind of magic and beauty that when we're really at our best, we bring to the world. And it's good to do that particular thing, whatever that is, and to do it really well. Like it matters. I learned, uh, learned a new expression. Viste me despacio que tengo prisa. It's like, uh, if in, I'm learning Spanish, but it's like, dress me slowly. I'm in a hurry. Uh, and it, I'm like, yeah, what a great expression. But it's like, uh, things are really um, uh, lit on earth right now. Move slow and deliberate. Because when you start to rush, you make a lot of mistakes. So it's like, move slow, be intentional. And uh, it's like that with remembering our purpose. We're going we're gonna to be dead soon. And it's good to inquire about what it is to do your very specific self. So the ancestors are excellent guides at remembering that. If you're like, I'm not as clear about that as I could be. How do I get more clear? Ask them really like they have perspective on it and uh, and finally it's just for the intent of leading a more resourced and resilient life if you're like my life is really stressy i work in the emergency room or i do cultural healing and it's really messy hard work and i get lit up all the time or whatever it is the ancestors to be in communion with them not to think about them but to actually relate with them um it can it can bring a source of resilience that wasn't present before. And that's a perfectly good uh, reason to engage. So that's, uh, those are general things about what do I mean with ancestral engagement, what it is, what it, what it isn't. But what I want to say in the next you know 20 minutes is a few things that I've noticed in the last 20 some years of doing this work of focusing on it a bunch and, uh, and how it shows up in our everyday life. Like, what have I noticed about how my life and others' lives doing this tend to shift a bit from year after year relationship with them? And because it's not, it's not something I hear people talk about a lot. So I want to make a little space for it. There's four things I want to say generally, and then we'll, yeah, go from there. One, um, when I say that we are the face, that this is like the face of my ancestors, that you're the face of your ancestors, that your body is their body, your voice is their voice. It's already like that. Whether or not you do anything, whether or not you ever think even one time in a conscious way about the ancestors per se, doesn't matter. It's already like that. It's just structural. It's, you know, it is a little bit like the, the branch being like, I heard that there are trees, I'm going to commune with the tree, and I'm like, I'm connected to the tree, I'm going to try really hard to feel connected to the tree, and that's fine, but like, it, even if you fail, it's still just like that, it's fine. So, it, and yet, engaging and bringing it conscious is different than not bringing it conscious. So it doesn't matter some. In the same way, like people who focus on enlightenment as a, as a frame, right? If you get them in the mood, they'll be like, yeah, we're already, we're already kind of enlightened. Like there's nothing we need to do. It's already fine. It's fine. But it, it isn't also. Like you should sit and do practice or do prayer or do the things that cause you to embody it more because it matters whether or not you get that directly or if you're just wearing somebody else's insight, you can wear it, but you didn't, you didn't make it. I like guess not, um, 
didn't have that experience of it personally. And so it makes a difference. But we could say also about the, like I teach earth reconnection ritual, all that. And it's funny because we don't need it. We're already, like, it's not like we're not already connected. This is the earth. This is the voice of the earth. Your body is the body of the earth. The internet, all the thing, all the ideas and all the thoughts and all the things that we don't think are very earthy are still the body of the earth and the sun and the stars and all that. We don't need to improve upon anything. And still, part of it is cultivating our actual personality and character and like in training the stubborn part of us that doesn't think it's like that to come on board a little more consciously, you know? So it's fine as it is, and it matters that we do practice both. And this applies with the ancestors. We're already like, you're already the face of your people. The choice is really, are you gonna um, play that out more or less consciously. The risk, if you play it out less consciously, is you recreate the painful stories because they uh, they will recreate very generously. Yeah, uh, you don't even have to. It's not like the ancestors show up and they're like, we would like to just recreate this trauma pattern today. How's that sound to you? You're like, uh, sure, let's do that. <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen. So, you know, it just happens. So that's kind of the default. Okay. If you happen to have a moment or a bunch of moments or a regular experience that your uh, face is their face and that you're kind of this um, collective organism also, even though you know how to not be socially awkward about it, it's important that you couple that delightful, weird understanding with the truth that everybody else is also the face of their ancestors. This means that uh, in practice, it means that in any interaction, it's me and my people speaking with you and your people. There's an interaction between us. And that has a lot of implications, actually. A, a few of them uh, are that you may have noticed that people's way of responding to us in the world um, isn't always so personal. It might feel very personal, but sometimes people respond to us because we're a guy, because we're white, because we're from this or that country, because we're speaking in this way, because we have a certain amount of money, presumably, or whatever it might be. People respond to you as the symbol of a thing, you know, and nicely or not very nicely. But it, it understanding consciously. That it's like, oh, it's, it's that person and at least some among their people responding to me as my people, as the face of my people. And, uh, and I don't like it very much right now. But I can see it happening. And that opens up some different choices. And because it also means you can speak in moments as your people and leverage that, you can leverage that for really um, constructive acts of repair and even occasionally apology. Like, I'm sorry for what we've done. It's really wrong and I'm very sorry for it. Like just generally, even just using that as an in and like as a magnet to notice like anything in your lineages, like respond to that kind of thing. And uh, so there are all kinds of ways to consciously work with the pragmatic view that like, oh, I'm, it's me and my people relating with others and their people all at once, okay? It also means that um, it's good to not run away from the cultural troubles that we're connected to. Like we, like we can't, like we, I mean, you can try to avoid it, but what you're running away into is individuality. Be like, no, I'm, I, I'm going to sever from my ancestors in order to avoid sitting in the cooker of that cultural pain. Like I need, to, I need to have distance from that so badly. I will become very individualistic. I, I just was born. I'm not accountable for anything else. I'm an individual. 
ooh, that brought temporary relief. Oh wait, now I have a loneliness problem. Now I have a really confusing isolation, where do I belong problem. Well, yeah, you just created that problem because you, 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 you unplugged from your identity understandable to bring a little relief but it brought a different kind of pain so you plug back in and you're like oh damn me us our people i we we did some bad shit let me take a breath and participate in fixing that good it might be hard but you won't be lonely not like you were before you tried to be an individual so there's a little trade-off if you want you want this uh illusion of freedom of being an individual but it comes as a comes at a cost and uh, another way of saying that is is we're born we're born into ancestral blessings for one it's so good really if you turn to get to know your people and and you just ask them like how are we awesome they're like oh there's so many ways let us tell you about it there's so much goodness even if you, th you think badly of them, they're like, I know these people hurt your feelings really bad. They were out of balance. We're so sorry. Let us take you in a boat a hundred miles from the beach. You won't even be thinking about the waves. We want to show you the giant squid and our magical powers to summon storms and all this stuff. And it's a very different landscape with the much older dead. So there's so much cool stuff to get into, right? And the other side of that is the... Um, unaddressed work, the collective burdens and pain and things that are still in need of repair. And so if we want belonging, being like, okay, I am going to open that big trunk of like sort of scary intergenerational stuff and like wear it. And, and that means things like really tangible reparations, repatriation of land, very tangible, sustained, multi-generational acts of decolonization, like tangible repairs are in order. People feel so good if we could do more of that. I mean, like so good for everybody's soul, but um, it, it, it's also very rational once we stop pretending to be individuals only. Because it's like, oh, well, was, of course, our group hurts your group. Like, we hurt you. Like, we all hurt you all. And we don't wanna live like that, I'm sorry. Like, how can we um, move forward together? Yeah. And so all that uh, cultural repair work uh, makes even more sense from like a metaphysical perspective. Last two things, um, you know, so the first two were like, it's already fine. And the second is like, other people are the face of their people too. The, the third is, um, it's kind of related to what I was saying is, uh, our lives are not really our own. Not only, they're not only our own. And that's actually really good news. And we t it's, a, it's an unreasonable kind of burden to be like, here's your individual life. Go individually, figure it out. Try to be happy before you die. Good luck. <laughs> really? Okay. Uh, but we, it's, it's from this flawed starting set of presumptions that we're, that we're kind of separate, but we're not. And... Uh, I was reading today in the news about a young Iranian Kurdish woman who, uh, uh, it's emotional to talk about it. Uh, she fled the Iran to join the Kurdish resistance in Iraq. And, you know, it's, it's like, this is going to be my life. She made a choice after being treated very, very badly by the authorities in Iran to, uh, to do it like that. And I can almost, you know, I can guarantee that of all the things she's probably struggling with today, it's not belonging. 
because there's a sense of like, um, well, on a soul level, this is the moment I'm in. This is what courage looks like in this moment. If I don't let my life be organized around this, my soul is going to suffer from it. This might not be a, a trajectory for a long life, but it's a trajectory for an intact soul over multiple lifetimes. So I'm going to move toward that. Yeah, it's courageous. It's courageous and it's also recognizing the bigger patterns and saying, I'm going to do it like that. I like if that's what it costs to belong in this situation, I'm in. It's very scary, but I'm going to do it like that, right? And it means uh, being less afraid to die. And on the flip side, choosing to move in a less individualistic way means more fear of uh, your elders and accountability and the bigger powers, like a healthy kind of fear. Like when I, uh, it'll happen in little ways, but when I feel like I've, I've stepped out of like alignment, it's very, it's very uncomfortable and very um, like vulnerable. And there's a sense of like, oh, like, yeah, uh, is like um, taqwa in Islam. That's one of the words for it. It's like holy fear of God. And, uh, uh, but the, uh, the, it's a good thing. It's a, it's a quality that we could um, stand to have more of in our life. And what I'm, another way of saying it is like, when you die and your elders are like, you're like the real elders, not like the people who are older than you who abused you and then they died and you're glad they're dead or like not, like not just the older people, but the people who embody elder qualities, the kind forces of the universe, whether or not you've met them in your lineages. When you die, you don't want to show up to them and have them be like, how to go? You know, that's a big deal to go to earth. Like talk to us about it. And you just be like, well, I didn't risk much. I played it safe. And I want to be like, oh, yeah, but now you're dead. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so uh, it should be a scary thing to not do what we're here to do, to not be ourselves. That's a relevant kind of fear. We have a moral obligation to be ourselves, to really dig into what that means for each of us, not in a scripted way, not to follow some outer program, but to dig into what, like how you've been shaped on a, on a deep soul level and to, and to bring that out in the world if you can. And not doing that, it's gonna, it's gonna sting if you don't make that a priority. It'll, it'll feel bad later. And uh, a, a couple other things that like <laughs> follow from uh, endeavoring to be the face of your people is that you also end up with more easy access to big states like collective love or like really enjoyable states and perspectives. And, and feeling like um, you know, I just uh, try not to speak bad about the United States here, but it's hard. I'm still like in detox. It's just starting, really. And uh, what's what caused me to think of it in this moment is uh, my ancestors of blood have lived at least six generations in the united what's now the united states on any lineage like there's no recent i mean recent but there's no really recent uh, european ancestors it's all early settlers and uh, my feeling of the move is informed by the fact that i've been doing the ancestor you know dance for a minute but the way I'm experiencing it is like um, me on behalf of my people. I'm like, I'm, I'm thrown in the towel. I can't do it anymore. I need a break, at least a break. I'm out. 
like it's not safe for the kids. I can't get them safe food. I can't like it's too much trauma. I need a break. And and we, the feeling like is is like me and like us, my people. It's like I'm with them and I'm like, y'all gave it your go, like your best, but like I can't, I can't keep doing it this way. And uh, my sense from them is they're like, no, we get it. There's a curse. It's a big, like systemic curse and it's hard to lift and you know we 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 understand but i i say that because um it's an example on an everyday level of how i'm experiencing a life change a little bit as them but that can happen with anything it can be like a, a really like tender beautiful thing like i went i went to london for like the first time ever in 2019 and my feeling was like, oh, it's been a minute. Like, oh, it's changed. Like, I've never been there in this life. But they're like, oh, look, it built this and it's changed and all that. And uh, so uh, our, it's good to be porous a little as an individual. It, it makes more interest in life. And, and just the states of like, am I... Um, it, <laughs> Are these the words of my ancestors now? Are they my words? Like, are you listening as uh, you as an individual? Are you listening? Are my people talking to your people right now? Can we just move and right? Can, can we allow that to be less socially awkward to just know it's always like that? I think we'd be able to relax a little more and see each other in a bigger context, more generous context, really. Um, and the last thing I want to say about uh, the last other four principles is that um, relating with the ancestors, even allowing our identity to soften and become porous with them or through them, it is the most normal thing in the world you could do. It's not spiritual, it's not esoteric, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't, all that doesn't matter. Very, very um, normal human way of moving in the world. It is unusual to not do that. It is unusual and I would say even culturally pathological to think that you can actually sever uh, your connection to them. Like you're trying to chew your arm off or something. There's no, you can't. Um, it's a structural thing, right? Historically, pretty much everybody's ancestors, more or less, and many people still have had some way of relating with the uh, consciously with the dead who are not dead, who are not somewhere else. They're not some when else, or they're in the moment. They're here, All right? They're here in the talk. They're not abstractly here. They're like specifically here right now. And uh, that's, just, that's like that all the time. It makes it a little more like, oh, what's happening now? When we name it, it's like that all the time. And uh, the majority of humans on earth still have a framework for all this. Whether or not they're given a lot of attention to it, they're like, oh yeah, mm, that's a thing. You know? And so it's a... Um, it really is a minority demographic who's like, oh, that's very irrational. That's like a spiritual thing. Find that in the spiritual shelf at the bookstore. That is a, a very like, keep that, keep that compartmentalized. Keep it out of science and education and politics and all the, the real things. That's, a, that's a, another kind of thing. <laughs> like, oh my God. So uh, I say that because like notice the judgments that creep in. When I say it's the most normal thing in the world, and I'll try not to go off too much on this, but um, it pains me to see, um, I love what I do to help people reconnect with their ancestors. And in another way, it's very sad because it's like helping um, people who've experienced cultural abuse to uh, come back into a place of embodying very basic life skills. And um, 
and it's often intergenerational, so we don't even clock it as a kind of abuse. But at some point, our people were discouraged from even being in relationship with our ancestors. If you've lost the framework, maybe you haven't. And, uh, and that's sad. And the conditions under which that has happened are often really um, unkind or downright like genocidally bad at times. And, uh, and now this is a more subtle thing. Like you can do that privately if you don't share it at work and if you don't really want outer societal power too much, sure, you can do that privately, please. <laughs> it's all right for politicians to be like, yeah, I'm a Christian or a Muslim. Hopefully it's okay uh, with that or whatever it is. But to be like, yeah, I'm giving honor to my ancestors and all that. It's like, hmm, you're breaking rules, you know, when you say that out loud. How many people like are, do you know, people from all over the world, Nicole, I know, but in most of the parts of the world, it's not a, uh, um, a thing you do out loud. And that's because there's a lot of judgment around it. And that judgment is uh, part of the apparatus of colonialism that continues to recreate itself, separate people from their ancestors and from the land. It's bad news. And it's possible to notice it and uh, interrupt it. Not by getting all intellectual and deconstructing it, that's fine, but really just by coming back into relationship. And like, I mean, like, hey, ancestors, whew. sorry, I haven't said hey to you my whole life, but hey, good morning. Start there. And just that might be like, whew, now I can't stop crying. All I did was say hello. Like, oh, maybe there's something there. Yeah. So anyways, let me say that. Um, I still want to make space for practice, but like maybe one or two people, if you have something that's really, um, keep it heart connected um, if you have something. And if not, we'll go to uh, practice for a minute and then see what time we have left. Okay, let's do that then. I'll talk you through a thing for like 10 minutes and then we'll yeah, see what time we have left. But nothing big, keep it gentle. Give yourself permission to shift gears a little bit. And if you would bring your attention to your heart and your belly and your feet, like let your energy be settled in your body. Uh, by using your breath or however it gets you there. And from that place, uh, call near to you whatever powers or connection to the sacred you already know and trust and feel good about. Let yourself be resourced a bit, however that is for you right now. Take a moment and hold intent that your space is clear or free from any interference or negativity, anything that doesn't need to be in your space. And finally, ask that there be a layer of protection or containment around you. And from that place of being rooted in your body and resourced, clear, protected, take a minute and just notice the um, network of relationships that you have with the larger body of humanity, not just through your parents and biological ancestors, but like you're connected up a lot. 
some of those connections are really lovely and some are more complicated, but just notice outside your circle, like there's a lot of uh, roots and connections. Just notice it first. And then bring in another layer of nuance there. Ask that any of those connections near to you, they're not so helpful, not so wholesome right now. They're still kind of heavier in their process. Hold intent that those ones take just a step back from your personal space and that you invite closer those qualities of energy, those ancestors who are in a really healed and vibrant and loving condition to just draw nearer to your circle just a little bit of rearranging so you know you're surrounded by the wholesome ones. And from there, be curious, you're just holding a question, how your own interests, your own aversions, your own, you know, the things you're drawn to or not drawn to in this life. Try on the possibility that at least a good part of that is an ancestral continuation. And just notice, you know, notice how it feels if you try on that possibility. Don't try to rationally make sense of it. It could be from older ones. Try it on. Maybe you try on the possibility that at least a good part of your personality structure, like how you are as a person, you know, how you show up in the world, there's also an influence and a continuation from them. Take a minute and try on the possibility that something about your deeper soul level calling, like what you feel like you're here to do and what really matters to you. But that's also in part, at least, an inheritance from them, a work that you're carrying on from them. Try on the possibility of it. Not in a mental way, but just notice that what we think is us, is us, but it's part of a bigger network. And notice now, if you would, being in your grounded place with the kind and supportive ancestors around your circle, consider the possibility that your body, your very physical form, is a kind of um, extension of their consciousness, at least in part. It's like a dipper from the river.
without needing to make anything happen. See if you can just relax into whatever level of easy communion with them feels available right now. Doesn't have to be a big thing. Notice how it is to share your purpose, your body, your personality, your habits, your temperament with them. From that place of just resting in presence with them, if it feels available, if it feels authentic, you might explicitly welcome their support and their blessing for your life. Like, help me out. If I'm of you, make it good for me here. And take another moment and practice just resting in that. There's nothing you need to do or improve upon, but just notice how it feels to rest with them and as them and as their face, their body here. Take a moment and just thank them. If it feels good where you're at, of course, you can just keep hanging out in that space. But we'll wrap up the practice part in a moment here. But give thanks to them. And when you shift your attention, notice the aspect of you that stays easily in connection with them. We're, uh, you know, we're having such a moment. We, you know, we humans in this form have been here at least 300,000 years, but really some millions of years before that. And uh, we've come to a kind of crossroads, it seems, where we've, um, there's a lot of us and we've made a pretty big mess of, of things recently and the ancestors who are in the present who are the collective wisdom of all the humans that have lived they have some things to say about that and they would like to see it go in a better way and part of how we move out of where we've cornered ourselves into is uh, give up, the, uh, kick the habit of thinking we're separate individual, separate individuals. It's not working out very well. It's really painful because when you come back from it, 
like when you, you know, like there's a hangover and there's a, a need to kind of assess the wreckage that uh, played out from when you or your people or your culture or your nation um, went on an individuality bender. You're like, yeah, I can get away with that. How much you can't. It's self-harm, really. And uh, there's a lot of grieving to be done. Uh, and that's hard, a little to hang out in, but it's just the cost of um, trying to stay current with what's playing out. Because things are moving so quickly in a way. Um, it's like, you know, do it really, uh, trust me, slowly. We're in quite a rush. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's one question and I want to respond to that came through in the chat. And we might have time for another one, but uh, uh, somebody asked, oh, what can I do about uh, around the baby inside of me? I'm in my seventh month of pregnancy and I want the best for him in his life. Uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a great question. There's a lot you can do. Um, besides really just love that one and yourself a lot and be protective and invite a ton of support and if it's your first kid, get ready to do all that on very little sleep and uh, really um, let in support besides all those like generally wholesome parent things. Um, it's possible to uh, intentionally and gently because, you know, doing the work when you're pregnant is very possible. You want to be a notch more gentle and protective of your space. It's possible to assess what troubles have not yet been resolved in your lineages and call in your older ancestral support to clean those things up in a way that doesn't bring any harm or risk to you or your baby. To the contrary, it's creating a larger circumference of safety and like a larger uh, circle of protection around you and him. And it also leads to a more resourced and held birth because birth is really vulnerable and it it would be great if we routinely held birth as this between the worlds magical ancestors are returning to the, this dimension kind of uh, really a magical event that it is but we don't always but you can and so you just do it that way because you know you choose to and uh uh, at, at least those things. And there's a, there's a lot of folks in the Ancestral Medicine Practitioner Network who also happen to be really uh, witchy moms or dads or genderqueer parents. And, and uh, uh, yeah, so you can um, reach out if you wish. There's another good question out. Have we neglected to say farewell and thank you to the ancestors we called in? I never send the spirits away anymore. I don't do it. Like I've been in traditions where they do it, but um, being in Yoruba land in West Africa, they, I, the way they modeled it is really um, resonates with me. There's, there's like nothing happening or people are whatever they're doing what they're doing and then suddenly it's like ritual is happening and commotion and possession and everything you know like ritual is happening and then and then it's not and then people are doing stuff and then oh well and then and then it's happening again <laughs> but there's there's no like we are now completing the ritual kind of thing it's just like all right then it's just like we're done now and what it uh, how i receive it and what feels true is uh there's no other, there's not another world, there's not another dimension, there's not like two realities or more, there's just one big, strange, tangly, wibbly wobbly reality, right? It's just one, uh, it's just one thing. And um, uh, it, it's fine if it's your habit to like say to them, what I tend to do is be like, hey, all, we're not focusing on you now, 
I'm going to go do very secular things. So like, don't expect me to pay attention to you. But if you want to sit on a couch and eat popcorn, I mean, it's your, it's your house too, you know, so that, uh, I don't have a need to, to send them away unless they're being overly intense and then you can be like, dial it down. But uh, it's, a, it's a good question. So I don't do ritual closings anymore usually. I'll be like, thanks, we're done now. But I don't ask them to go away. Uh, not with the ancestors. If you're invoking strange things, maybe. <clears throat> okay. I know we need to finish soon uh, and I didn't allow a space for a whole lot of questions. I can hang out for a few, but let me say that the Beyond Blood offering coming up will be good. It'll be in vibe kind of like this, but 90 instead of 60 minutes with more experiential practice and tangible skills. And the short course, which we're still pulling together for December will be all about grief and heartache and loss, and how to navigate that in different ways uh, that are connective. So uh, check out what we're up to with the organization if you want. There's a ton of good people, and uh, I appreciate your engagement and attention, everybody tonight. I know your time is precious, and nobody needs more time on the computers. So thank you all. Thanks to the powers. May you go or not, as you wish. <laughs> yeah. Um.